presentation today for the Almost Seven Star Party 2023, Ed Witkowski, uh, who has had most of the roles I think uh, Novak has in the uh, the Astronomy Club officers. He's been on the board quite active and all, but uh, in the past. But he he talks about he really got started with astronomy during the Apollo days, and uh, he mentions he had a uh, an older brother that built a, a scope when they were living in Chicago. And I'm assuming you guys may have been involved with uh, the planetarium program for scope building then. But, uh, so, you, and uh, he even has confessed uh, to some of us that, that he sometimes played sick so he could stay home and watch the Apollo launches. And, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, we've known him in various roles, I guess, outreach coordinator, president, uh you name it uh and we sometimes have seen his kids at star party so uh i th i think people are primarily interested in what you have to say but i do encourage you if you get a chance to corner him at a star party sometime find out about some of his kennedy space center visits because he's got some great behind the scenes stories there but but ed uh let's let's hear you well good afternoon and uh thanks for uh um inviting me to uh, provide my or make my uh, start cluster presentation um, a little bit of other uh, introduction um, primarily regarding star clusters and how I uh, began observing star clusters is when I returned into the uh, it began uh, enjoying amateur astronomy once again back in 1998 I inherited a pair of uh, Fujinon 10 by 70 binoculars. Um, and if you've never had the experience of using some, they're uh, nice and heavy and very rugged. However, the optics are phenomenal. They're very clear um, and they're, they're a beautiful pair of binoculars and they provide you with a nice wide view of the sky. So uh, um, that was sort of my first introduction. And then um, I branched out a little bit into telescopes when I purchased a, uh, an older used uh, Teleview Pronto, which is a set, which is a 70 millimeter uh, telescope. And uh, searching through objects to enjoy, uh, one of the sets of objects that popped out at me were star clusters. Um, and we're going to talk about the variety of star clusters, but one thing that sort of launched me into observing them more was that uh, one of the, there's a scientist that did a paper uh, back in the early 1900s named Per Colander. And he's from uh, Lund University. And while I was uh, searching on the web, it was like, you know, his name keeps coming up. He did a, uh, a, a cataloging of open clusters and it was like, I'm going to send them a, an email and say, hey, do you have like a, a photocopy of his paper? Um, so I sent them, you know, I looked up, you know, Lund University and here's the, you know, in, contact us, astronomy department at Lund University. So I sent them a, an email and I figured I'd get like a, you know, a half decent Xerox copy, right? Well, Three days later, I'm sitting at work, and this was back in about 2000, 2001 time frame, and our logistics person comes over and he goes, Ed, I don't know what you're doing with your astronomy stuff, but you're getting some crazy stuff. So this International Express mail package for you. I'm like, hmm, okay. I'm thinking, hey, maybe that's the, you know, the Lund, you know, paperwork. Well, I, en I ended up opening it up and there was a note, you know, can, you know, dear Mr. Odkowski, here's a copy of Per Colander's dissertation for you to use in your personal research, because I said I was doing personal research. Well, they sent me a brand new copy that had never been used um, because uh, it was printed to where there was a number of pages that made up one sheet. So I had to go with a exacto knife and cut the pages in order to read it, um, and it was a great academic paper. It's not uh, for the faint at heart when it comes to science, uh, but I really became interested in star clusters and uh, started observing them. Um, so let's get in, get started on uh, star clusters here. So there's two specific types of 
star clusters. There are open clusters, and those are uh, distinct. Their distinction is that they're very dispersed. Okay, and then globular clusters, or as some people call them, globular. Um, but they are those some of those beautiful fuzzballs that you're able to see uh, through your telescope, uh, primarily usually during the summer and autumn time frame, because uh, that's really the the globular cluster season, because they really ride along the uh, the spine of the uh, Milky Way, and we'll go over a few uh, choice uh, you know globulars in a, in a few minutes. Um, so let's get started on, on open clusters. So what is an open cluster? Um, technically, it's a physically related group of stars held together by the mutual gravitational attraction of the stars. Now, the, these stars are, of course, holding themselves together, but it's not an overly uh, powerful, organized uh, arrangement. Um, and you'll see that open clusters are very uh, varied in shape and size, while globulars are very much those round circles with, you know, that are very, very condensed. Um, so how are they classified? Um, there are a few scientists that uh, did uh, different classifications. Uh, the Harlow-Shapley scheme is a simple um scheme and it primarily addresses the concentration and the richness of the uh of the uh, open cluster uh there was another scientist rj trumpler uh, who did a more sophisticated and detailed scheme or cataloging of star clusters and he adds brightness to the scheme so uh shapely's like i mentioned very simple you know it's either very loose irregular Loose and poor, intermediately rich, fairly rich, or considerably rich and con, uh, con concentrated. While the Trumpler scheme gets a little more detailed, you get into strong concentration towards the center, weak concentration towards the center. Um, then you add in the range of brightness. So there's a either a small range in brightness in the, the stars, or there's a large range of brightness. So they're either very... They're almost like all, and I'll throw out a, a magnitude seven, or there's a few that are five, and there are a few that are nine, and there are a few that are eight. Um, so that gets a little bit more uh, in depth into actually cataloging the cluster uh, from that aspect. And then the richness, how many stars make up that open cluster? Um, is it only a few stars, you know, 50? Is it moderately rich? You know, there's about 50 to 100, or is it really, really rich with stars? And we'll sh I'll, I'll be showing you a, one of those later on, where there's a lot of stars, about 100 plus stars in that cluster. How open are star clusters? Right there, right in front of you, that you're looking at on your screen is the very easily identifiable Big Dipper which is part of the Ursa Major open cluster. That is actually a cluster, open cluster of stars. And um, they are, there have been scientists that have done studies of how the uh, Big Dipper primarily appeared many years ago and how it's going to appear in years ahead because it's actually also a, a moving cluster. So all the stars are moving at a very um, identifiable uh, rate. Um, I won't go into that detail here because that's a little bit beyond the scope of where I'd like to you know, discuss open clusters, but that is how open they can be, is that open, or they can be quite compact, like uh, Messier 67 in um, the constellation Cancer. And as you notice, a vast majority of the stars are of the same stellar type. Uh, you remember the old, oh, be a nice girl and kiss me, you know, oh, be 
you know, the the, the uh, main sequence stars, um, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, so first off, we're going to start off with a few select summer and fall open clusters. Uh, we're going to talk about one uh, colander object, which is colander 399, um, named the coat hanger, and you'll see why it's called the coat hanger. Uh, we'll talk about M7, the stinger, which is a star cluster that is at the tail end of Scorpio. Scorpius, the very end. Uh, we will also talk about the ever famous uh, double cluster in Perseus, which is a phenomenal object. And uh, most of these objects have a little bit of a story, and there's actually a little story with the double cluster I'll, I'll, I'll mention to you. Uh, there's 7789, NGC 7789, known as Caroline's Cluster or the White Rose Cluster. And it's called the Carol Caroline's Crust Cluster because Caroline Herschel was the one that discovered it while observing with William Herschel. So the coat hanger. So some appear to be, but actually are not. So here you have the coat hanger. And specifically, we're going to address the brightest stars in the that make up the coat hanger. These stars, and then these stars right here. Um, this star here is a major star in the constellation Volpecula, the fox. And then these two stars here. So remember four, five, and seven, because there have been studies that have been done measuring the actual distances of the stars in the coat hanger, their stellar types and their distances. And as you can see, they are not an open cluster in the classic sense. They are an optical, what's called an optical open cluster in that they appear to be a, a cluster. They're actually an asterism that appears to be a cluster, but they're not an actual open cluster because the distances to the stars, especially four and five and seven, are vastly different. There's a wide range of distance and the star types vary also. Um, in a classic open cluster, a vast majority of these should be of one type versus this wide range that you that you have. Um, here we have M7, the stinger. Um, as I mentioned, note that a vast majority of the stars in the cluster are of the same type. These are nice blue, young blue stars. That's going to be a key in a little bit of a discussion here momentarily, that they are relatively young blue stars in the main sequence. What's called the main sequence is that, you know, stars are born and then stars die. And they are born as being beautiful, bright blue stars, and they end up being red at the end when they supernova and, and blow up. And these are relatively young, relatively beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful sight. And when you're out at a, you know, when you're out at the star party, you will be able to, and I'll backtrack real fast, you can see the coat hanger by naked eye. You can see the you can see M7, and then you have the double cluster. The double cluster is located in Perseus. Um, the double cluster consists of stars that have been estimated to be only, and this is when we're going to get into they are being them being very young stars. The estimates, current estimates for their age, is approximately 15 million years. So these are very young stars that have been formed in close proximity to one another, and they're gathering in that those two clusters that are right there. This is readily visible. Uh, you can see it out, uh, definitely see it out at 
Crockett on our real good night, um, Camp High Road, any of the dark sky sites locally, but especially out at the Almost Heaven Star Party, it is definitely a, a uh, naked eye, eye object for you. This is NGC 7789. And when we are talking about how condensed the open cluster is, this is an example of how very condensed it is they can be. Um, it's in Cassiopeia. Um, this is all the one that is known as Caroline's cluster or the white rose cluster. Now, uh, there's a little story about how I came upon um, this object. It was when I was when I had my tele my Teleview Pronto, um, and I was just scanning Cassiopeia because it's right there, beautiful place right where the Milky Way is, and it was like. I saw this fuzzy, fuzzy, I mean, almost circular object. And I thought it was something on the optics at first. Um, but no, it was a it was not, there was no resolution quite yet. Um I did crank up the power, you know, with, with my eyepieces, and stars did come out, and I was able to see more of the beautiful detail. But this kind of a detail with this uh, wide of view is not really uh, available until you jump into better uh, optics. And that's where my Teleview 85 comes in, is that it comes in, comes through exactly like this, except for a, a lot of the background stars. But it is be a beautiful sight in that it's compact, but the stars are just making it through and it's like having a little pile of, of sugar on on black velvet is probably the best way to describe it um and so then we have another one it's a beautiful object also and as you can see relatively young stars once again and this is m52 also in cassiopeia so i pretty much selected uh the objects for ease of observing but a vast majority of the open clusters that are visible are easily observed and i'll go over a little bit of how you can observe them easily uh closer to the end of the presentation um so now we're going to talk about a little bit about a few of the select as i call them select winter ones well winter spring i know we're not there yet but these are a few that you can look forward to in the future um the classic beautiful m45 the pleiades uh m35 and ngc 2158 there's a great story with that uh, there's the three uh the three musketeers in Ariga of 37 36 37 and 38 uh, there's um, M41 in uh, Canis Major, um, M44, famous object in Cancer, and then, of course, Colander 70, which is Orion's Belt. And that's, we'll talk about open, open, open object once again. Uh, one of my favorite objects to observe, and I'm, when I may, when I say favorite, I've spent hours and hours looking at the Pleiades. Maybe I'm insane, maybe I'm not, but I think it's a beautiful object to observe. Um, going through the different levels of magnification, uh, going through the different fields of view, uh, I don't. I think it never ever fails to uh, be a beautiful, uh, stellar view. Beautiful astronomical object to observe perfect probably one of my it is my favorite um one of my favorites but it is a favorite um so and if you don't realize if you have a subaru those are that is pleiades in uh, japanese so um there's your subaru symbol right there um so now you have M35, which is this 
open cluster here and 2158 which is here um it's truly an open beautiful open cluster and that it's very wide open it's very rich and then uh one year many many years ago this is going back to observing with pete johnson once again um he had his telescope aimed at gemini and he's like hey take a look and i'm like oh cool and i'm looking in the telescope and i'm looking and i'm thinking wow that's great i'm looking at m35 well we were actually looking at 2158 and it was with his 24 inches of optics it looked like m35 but we were actually looking at this region here and it was a phenomenally beautiful amazing sight um i've used many of these objects as uh observing objects at outreach events um like the double cluster i used a, a number of years ago at a uh one of the astronomy days, it was either astronomy day or uh, stargaze. And I had an older gentleman come over with his granddaughter and he had never looked through a telescope before. And he's like looking at the double cluster and he's like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. I'm like, so I gave him the explanation of, yes, it's two different clusters and stars. And, and uh, a few months later, and this was when I was still outreach coordinator, or when I needed an Ego Boost Outreach Director, um, I received an email, and it was from the young lady who was this gentleman's granddaughter that brought him to the event. And she said that after seeing the double cluster, her grandfather went out and bought a pair of binoculars and went out in the backyard, and every single night he could go observing he tried to find the double cluster. If he couldn't, he would find whatever else was up in the sky to look at. Um, and he just became addicted to observing, uh, becoming a binocular observer because he bought a nice pair of binoculars and that's what he was going to observe with. And he totally enjoyed the night sky af after an in introduction of the uh, double cluster. Um, Auriga is another one of the great constellations um, that lies in the uh, winter uh, Milky Way. You have a variety. It's beautiful. Through, I mean, you really start down here and you work your way up here, and it's an absolute uh, festival festival of astronomical beauty um, to be looking through that part of the winter sky it's easily observable because it's literally overhead um, you have less of a problem with uh, light on the horizon and the objects are very readily visible in um, the urban areas that we live in uh, next we have m41 which is in uh, good old canis major the, the big dog um the bright star here is Sirius, and yes i'm serious about that being serious and this is where m41 is now it is a ver there is a wider range of stars that make up the cluster um but it is still a wonderful beautiful object um when we talk about asterisms and shapes in the sky m lots of these beautiful almost perfect lines and linear linear uh, sets up you know li linear uh, groupings of stars throughout the sky uh, winter can be great uh, if you have a nice clear dry uh, night in the winter time uh, when you don't have a lot of turbulence in the air you can have some beautiful beautiful viewing in, uh especially in the washington area but further out in the dark dark skies it's it's phenomenal um m44 in cancer um there again what are we gonna what are we looking at we're looking looking at a grouping of relatively young blue stars um even though it's 
it, it's beautiful, um, it's wonderful, and it's a great way to start observing is open clusters. So then um, further south, you have M46 and M47. Um, you have an extra bonus here of a planetary nebula. It's visible. Um, once again, you're in the plane of the uh, the Milky Way, right? You know, straight up and down winter time. Um, great. Uh, one of my uh, resources I use, and we'll talk about that a little later, is uh, some of the uh, star atlases that you can use and and uh, how you can get out observing. Uh, we'll end we'll end the winter spring objects with another one of those wide open 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 clusters, and that is Colander seventy, which are the star the actual belt stars and a number of stars that make up the region near Orion's belt. Um, now, some a few things you have to realize about per colander's work. It was done in the early 1900s, um, and a lot of it was very. Uh, it, looking at it from a modern day perspective, it was very rough in how he established what was a cluster and what was not. Um, the pa his paper has lots of great scientific analysis, lots of great statistics, lots of great math, but not every cluster that he thought of as being a cluster is really a cluster. Namely, like the coat hanger is the prime example. So now we're going to discuss uh, globular clusters. Um, so the distinctive feature is a they are a spherical collection of stars they look like a globe they're purely there it's a it's a, a fuzzy globe um they're very very tightly bound by gravity and they're found in the halo of galaxies um so they're that like i mentioned summertime and autumn are are plus uh globular time because you, right along the Milky Way, you have lots and lots and lots of globular clusters. Um, there are 152 of them in the Milky Way. Um, there is a classification system for them. Uh, there's the Shapely Sawyer concentration class, and it's based on concentration from 1 to 12. So, this is one of those great. Uh, you know, what's one, it's nice and wide. And then 11, you got these really dense, condensed, uh, really massive, massive objects. Um, let's do a few more here. We got what, some of the famous, famous globulars. Probably the most famous is M13 in Hercules. Uh, and this is, there are estimates, and these are just estimates that there are a half of a million stars in the globular cluster that make up M13. Some, some scientists say 100,000, some say upwards of a half a million stars make up that globular cluster. Um, it's true, one of the truly wonderful things with globulars is they really benefit from bigger optics um whereas open clusters benefit from uh the wider angle rich fueled telescopes and other uh, ob observing devices globulars really benefit and really explode with the bigger the telescope you're using um we had a uh outreach many years ago uh, there's a, a school called uh congressional school it's over in fairfax i think um and we had a outreach event and one of the members had a 12 inch 12 and a half inch scope and he was going through different eyepieces 
to show the students how you could see more and more and more of the stars by changing out the uh, the eyepieces, and it was wonderful seeing the explosion of stars e with each um, increasing magnification. Uh, here's a few more. Oh, I went, I went backwards. Sorry. Uh, so there are also extra galactic globulars. Uh, so what are extra galactic globulars? Extra gla galactic globulars are actually globular clusters that are not part of the Milky Way. Uh, one that has been determined to be extra galactic is M55 and Sagittarius. And then if you have happen to have the the luxury or the of a big 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 telescope and the right optics there are a number of visible globular clusters in andromeda in the andromeda galaxy so not only are you looking at our nearest galactic neighbor which is 2.5 million light years away you're looking at globular clusters that make up Andromeda. So the Andromedans, okay, we'll call them those today, when they're out looking at their, at the and Andromeda at night, that's one of the globulars they get to see in their night sky is G1. Well, we get to see it from here, but they get to see it there. So how do we observe these? How do we observe these objects? So with the explosion of the internet uh, it would be easiest and best and i could just say go to the internet but that is not i'm a little bit more old school than that um i started using the internet to do some of my researching but i uh, i'm sort of stuck in loving old printed paper um the astronomical league has an open cluster club and a globular club um it's a great great way to uh, introduce yourself to the night sky those observing programs are awesome because they're an, uh, a great selection of objects but if you want to do open clusters you want to do globulars it's a great introduction because not only do they have easy intermediate and then the real hard stuff it, it makes it fun <coughs> excuse me in that you have that range so i'm just going to get a drink real quick one of the other ways you can do your observing is by sticking with the messier objects and there's quite a few of the messier objects that are both open and globulars which makes it a wonderful um variety a wonderful choice uh you have the ngc objects many objects in there um a little more detailed a little more a uh, little bit more work on those um there is a wonderful book that was uh written by a Novak member. I believe he's still a Novak member. He's a Novak member at large. He lives in uh, Agstaff, uh, Brent Archinal. Uh, he and, and Mr. Hines, I don't remember Mr. Hines' first name, but um, they wrote a book on star clusters and it's an amazing, fantastic, great book. If you're able to get a copy, it's an awesome book. Um, it's an awesome resource. It's a great resource. Um, one of the uh, handiest observing observing uh, tools that I have is um, the Sky and Telescope Pocket Atlas, which is awesome. Um, so then we get to how do we observe from an equipment point of view? And this is where it's going to be uh, a little bit of uh, experience and a little bit of uh, what I am in my observing 
ast astronomy life and where I end up where I end up. So um, binoculars, a nice set of binoculars, at least 50 plus millimeters in diameter um, are an excellent, excellent introduction um, to observing anything and everything in astronomy, whether it's the moon, whether it's deep sky objects, binoculars are a great start. Um, they're very good for open clusters. They can be great fun with open clusters. They are good for globulars. They're not the best. They're, um, you know, a many, many of the globulars you're going to look at are still going to just be those pinpoint or those little fuzz balls, and that's all you're going to see. Rich field telescopes. Um, Teleview, uh, I'll say it, Teleview Pronto, the old Pronto. Teleview 85, uh, Teleview 101, any of those wonderful Televiews that I've had. And there are many newer scopes that are in that uh, category, in that arena now. But that's what I have, and that's what I enjoy using. Uh, it's portable. It's easily set up. Uh, beautiful, phenomenal, beautiful optics. Uh, excellent service. I had a, a jammed up focuser I had to get repaired. And luckily I was going up towards New York and I actually dropped it off at the Teleview uh, offices. It, a month and a half later, I received a perfectly rebuilt uh, focuser. Yes, I had to pay for it, but great service, very knowledgeable staff. Uh, but a Ridgefield telescope is perfect for observing open clusters. Um, you're able to get a nice, beautiful wide view, and then you can work your way towards a an intermediate sized view that can be, uh, you can coax out some of the details in like some of the more condensed open clusters like uh, Caroline's cluster, where you need a little bit more magnification and you need a little bit more optics in order to, to bring out the beauty in, in that in those objects. Larger telescopes, and I'm talking anything 10 inches plus, and I'm talking 10 inches to 20 plus, um, they may be good, maybe, maybe, and I'm saying maybe for some open clusters, um, like some of the more condensed, denser ones, but beyond any shadow of a doubt, they can be wonderful devices for observing uh, globular clusters, um, especially if you have a nice range of eyepieces where you can start with a nicer, wider view and work your way towards, you know, bringing out the beauty that's in those objects. Um, but that's a little bit of what I have. That's what I have for you today. Um, I'll bring back my title slide, uh, but that's what I have for you this afternoon. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed the presentation and hopefully you'll be uh, uh, excited about observing some uh, open clusters or globulars when you're out at uh, almost heaven or if you're out observing even, um, even at home here in the uh, DC megaplex. So uh, that's what I have for you today. And uh, I guess I'll open the floor for questions, I think. Thanks, Ed. That was great. Can, well, you're welcome. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the Astronomical League there? You, you mentioned their observing programs. Have you uh, worked with those very much? Yes, um, sure. Um, the Astronomical League is, uh, for those that do not know, uh, the Astronomical League is a organization of astronomy clubs so it's kind of like the big astronomy club of clubs and um they have what are called a number of observing clubs um which are uh, targeted at various observing uh various objects in the night sky and what happens is you'll have a list of 
And once you finish that list, you submit your uh, observing log, because you maintain an observing log, to the club's American League, uh, Astronomical League um, coordinator. There should be a representative from the club that gathers those observing, uh, you know, your observing forms and your observing logs, and you end up with a certificate. A real cool. I don't have them right here, so I do. I believe I have my globular and my open in the uh, in the other office, but in the office because I'm in the kitchen right now. But um, you end up with a, a really nice certificate and a pin for observing those different objects that are in your observing list. And as I mentioned, um, they almost all the observing clubs are broken out into relatively easy objects, intermediate, and then like they call them the challenge objects. Um, like there's the Messier club where you sort of have like the basic Messier and then you have like the upper Messier one. You have a uh, observing club for uh, lunar uh, where you do a lot of observing of the moon. Um, you do uh, a log of features you observe on the moon. Uh, that's another presentation I've got in the in the can that I can provide later on someday. Uh, lunar observing is a great, great thing, but they have a, a lunar observing. Uh, they have a galactic one. They have an NGC one. They have a Herschel club. They have a Herschel club, uh, solar, uh, asteroids. So um, it's a great opportunity to do a structured I'll, I'll use that term, a structured observing program. And they also have a very uh, wide range. So uh, they have what's called the Ob Urban Observing Club, where you're pretty much in D.C. or the suburbs, and you have a, a set of objects you observe in, in the city environment. But that's uh, sort of the Astronomical League in a nutshell. Thanks. You're welcome. Do we have other questions? Hey, that was a great presentation. Uh, I really appreciate Thank you. it. Um, I, you. You answered my question. I was just hoping that there was maybe sort of one setup that a, a new user, um, a new astronomer could, could buy to really capture both uh, all the different star clusters out there, as opposed to be, having to get one specific one like Richfield and others. So I, I was just curious, is there, I mean, if you have a recommendation, is, is there one that you would recommend? Well, I hear one of the things is that um, as with all telescopes, uh, the best telescope is, and this is an old saying, and it's been used a lot. The best telescope is the one you're going to use the most or that you are able to use the most. Um, some would direct you towards a larger telescope, and I'll use that term loosely in that some club members would say you'd like to, you probably would benefit from a smaller Dobsonian. Uh, some members like myself, because I have my limitations that limit to what I can do. Um, but if you can get an inexpensive, if you can get an inexpensive, uh, like, somewhere in the 100 millimeter range uh, rich field telescope, that is a wonderful introduction to the night sky. Um, because if you really want to coax out the details that some members are able to observe in darker or deeper sky objects like galaxies, you really need to have a much bigger, bigger, bigger telescope. Um, so it, it's sort of a, it's a trade-off. Do you want to learn the sky and take your time, or do you want to really dive in and and may you may end up being disappointed because not every you know people go oh that picture is awesome, but you're looking at a picture you're not looking at what is really in the night sky, and you're not you're not going to see that kind of detail unless you have a really gigantic telescope or you get into astrophotography. Um, 
I know the club usually around Christmas time, which is the best time, um, has a presentation on what is the best scope to get or how to shop for a telescope. Um, I also have to admit I've been out of the market for a while, so I really don't know what is really new in like the portable Dobsonians that are available. Um, but I like smaller uh, refractors. Um, yes, they can be expensive, but with the newer optics, there, there are many more reasonable ones available. But uh, like I mentioned, I've been out of the market for quite a while. I have a Teleview 85 that I've had for many, many years, and I still enjoy using today. Um, it's if you can get a nice scope on Astromart, uh, if Astromart's still around, um, but that's that's what I would recommend. Um, if you're a brand new, brand new, brand new, you know, just jumping in, get yourself a nice pair of binoculars and start scanning the sky. Um, see if that's if that if that satisfies you and you want more go from there um i i always do a more cautious approach to new new observers than some members because i don't want you spending a lot of money and then going oh i don't i can't do this or i don't have time for this so that's i really probably didn't answer your question but that, that's sort of my my uh my point of view on on new observing start small start binoc nice pair of binoculars work your way through identify what you want to observe um, then get to get to a telescope you may enjoy look just looking at the moon you may enjoy solar observing and that's a whole different that's a whole different swim lane so uh that's sort of my my advice when it comes to that thanks Ed. You're welcome. I, I would piggyback on that, that uh, Novak does have an excellent loan program for members, and we have a variety of uh, binoculars and telescopes that, that members can check out. And it's uh, like Ed saying, you know, don't just jump in and buy a bunch of stuff that you may not actually like. It's a good way to try before you buy. Thank you, Ed. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> 